Thanks, Chris. It's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just going to kick off with a couple of words about the Minor Self Foundation, if I can. Um, there's just a few slides we put up here. The, the, the first is to say that it's, it's probably the biggest online resource for Christianity and mental health um, around. So there's a whole, about a thousand different articles up there. There's about a hundred recordings of seminars like this. There's all manner of different things. There's Facebook, Twitter, Insta, what's it, and all that kind of stuff. So there's tons going on, and we basically just try and get as much as possible out there. One of the things that I'm delighted about is that if you go to most Christian conferences nowadays, you're going to see a, a session or a stream on mental or emotional health. And actually, you guys are probably ahead of the stream a little bit because you've been running events like this with that kind of focus for, for some years. But it's been great to see the church taking this more seriously. And of course, the um, government thinking, well, actually, hang on, maybe the church is a good resource here. So one of the things we, we've put together just on the next slide, mental health access pack is a quick, easy, sort of bite-sized resources for church and community groups. There's PDFs that you can download, study, the kind of thing that you can sort of have in the magazine rack kicking around about how faith and spirituality interact. And um, I have written a few books, so some of these are on the stand outside. I'm just going to flag, flag this one here, the Perfectionism book. Uh, which we finished a couple of years ago. Uh, it's got a quote on the back from Bear Grylls, which is as close as I can get to Crocodile Dundee. <laughs> but joking apart, um, there's some good people who've endorsed it. And perfectionism, I think, is the non-neurotic side of it, if that makes sense. We've got the worry book, the guilt book, people who are neurotic, really struggling with their mental health, depression. The perfectionists are the ones who are about to explode a few years down the track. Um, so if that's you, please have a little look at the perfectionism book. So thank you, thank you so much for having me. It is great, isn't it, to come to Australia. And one of the things that I was thinking back to when I was studying psychiatry, I'm, I'm a medical doctor, specialised in psychiatry, as opposed to surgery or obsingyne or something like that. And one of the things I was thinking, and I remember discussing this with, with my fellow junior doctors when we were studying, we thought, hang on, are there any psychiatrists in Australia? Because it's so nice and sunny isn't it? And I was in the north of England at, at this point, sort of working fairly close to, to where Chris is from. And it's quite grim up north, isn't it? I mean, Scotland's quite a lot better, I have to say. I, I, but, um, but, you know, it, we thought, oh, you know, you need psychiatrists in the north of England, but you don't need psychiatrists in Australia, do you? It's, it's all kind of get a little stubby and, um, you know, it, it's all pretty chill and laid back and you've got the sun. But, of course, the reality is, I'm just going to jump back into the, the, the slides here, there are over a million people in Australia with depression. There's, there's two million with anxiety. Six Australians die by suicide every day. And the, the, the truth, of course, is that um, a bit of sun for a couple of weeks helps, sure, as long as you don't spend your whole year working for it to get that extra, extra dollar to go on the holiday. A couple of weeks of sun, it's great to have a holiday. But mental health goes everywhere. It's no respecter of class. It's no respecter of climate particularly severe mental illnesses like schizophrenia, severe OCD, that sort of thing, no respect of, of, of gender as well. This is, these are illnesses that go across the, the entire globe. Um, quick show of hands, if we can. There's all sorts of statistics here, aren't there? Is it one in five? Is it one in four? Whatever. Who thinks the prevalence of mental illness is... I'm going to ask more or less, OK? Who thinks the prevalence of mental illness is more, i.e. more common than one in four. One in four or more common. Who, who thinks that? Okay. And who thinks the opposite? Who thinks it's less common than one in four? Who can't do maths? Okay, good. So, so most of you think it's more common than one in four. And that's interesting, isn't it? And of course, um, one of the things I was sort of thinking, well, actually, we're all mental to a certain extent, aren't we? We've all got social phobia, because the only people sitting on the front row are either paid by chorus or the speaker. <laughs> So you've all got a degree of social phobia. Come and do some exposure work with us, all right? Come and sit on the front row later, process those cognitions, and yes, is, am I dancing in time to the worship leader? Doesn't matter. You know, just let those cognitions float over you. We're going to come back to mindfulness and other things later. But, you know, joking apart, there is a spectrum here, isn't there? But the spectrum is important to bear in mind because at the severe end of the spectrum, at the severe end of the spectrum, serious mental disorders are having a massive impact on the Australian economy. So on, on the next slide, we can see that, um, that the cost... It's a little bit tiny-weeny down the bottom right there. All these slides are going to be available to you afterwards, by the way. But you, you can see down there $10 billion or thereabouts 
in lost earnings. Why is that figure so high? That is a massive figure. That is several percent of the GDP of Australia. And the numbers are high. And the reasons are that these are early onset disorders that significantly impact quality of life, ability to work, and obviously for some of them, things like schizophrenia, severe bipolar, even needing residential care, long-term support, hours of support each week. These are disorders that destroy people's lives. The cost here is bigger than cancer. Okay? The impact on the Australian economy of mental health conditions is bigger than the cost in treating cancer, because cancer gets you late in life. It's expensive, sure, to treat some of those funky new drugs. But the overall cost of mental illness is bigger than that. It's almost as big as heart disease, again, because it comes later in life. And there are things that we can do about it, but we're struggling, and that's what I'm going to try and cover today. Now, one of the topics that often gets talked about is this idea that, is there a rising suicide rate? And I've put a few graphs up here on the next slide, and as I say, they are sort of microscopic, but you can see the lines. That's all you need to see. The top right there, you can see this line going up. And those are the kind of graphs that often get shown in the press and the media. This is number of suicides in Australia since 1920 up until a couple of years ago. And you can see the graph going up, particularly among men, you can see the graph going up. Now, the problem is the population has gone up as well. So actually, when you control for population, that's the bottom graph on the left-hand side. The suicide rate does go up and down, but actually it's fairly static. Things that make a big difference on suicide are employment and war. Those are the things that... The less people die of suicide during times of war. They die of other things, unfortunately but something about the community drawing together, and employment, of course. But the suicide rate's reasonably chronic, and again, the middle graph there just puts Australia pretty much average on the national scene. So you will see headlines, you know, Australia has high suicide rate in such and such, or whatever it is. But actually, Australia's pretty average as far as mental health statistics go. What is high here, and what has changed, and what we've seen as changing over the past sort of few years is, is the rising rate of youth suicide. And those two graphs there on, on the right are about the fact that suicide is the leading cause of death for young men. It's a high cause. It's higher than road traffic accidents, okay? It's, it's a high-ish cause of death for, for, for females. It's been rising in that youth group. So there's something we're not getting right for youth, and we've known that for quite a long time. The next slide is, is more about self-harm. This is about self-harm hospitalisation. Now, what, what you can see here is that the female spike in the teens and the early 20s is huge. That's the green spike there. The blue spike for the men is still pretty high. And, and women do self-harm more than men. Don't forget, for every hospitalisation, there's probably another 5 to 10 who are coming to the emergency department and not being hospitalised or are, are, are not coming forward for any kind of, of medical treatment at all. But those are large numbers there in that group. And it's not as final as suicide, but it is an associated behaviour. Self-harm does not mean suicide. You will be coming across people all the time who self-harm. And I think one of the things I, don't want, to, I want to say is, don't panic, all right? Because if, if some young teenager has told you that they are self-harming, they will have been doing that for months. It will have taken them a huge amount of courage to come and talk to you. And if you get your child protection hat on and dash off to the principal, they're not going to speak to you again about it. Okay? You've got to earn their trust. This is a, we need to get past this health and safetyness here. You need to earn their trust. If they will stop doing it, if you tell them to, for a while, for a few weeks, a month or two, and then they'll start again. The way to stop harming in those groups is, as I say, talk to them. At some point, sure. You've got to escalate. You've got to talk to the parents. You've got to talk to the school. But that dis initial disclosure of self-harm, please don't get your, your health and safety hat on and overreact because the problem will just be buried and come back later. I'm quite happy to talk more about that later, but that's one of the things I wanted to say about, about self-harm. Because we've got to find a better way of doing it than pretending it's not happening or overreacting when it does happen. Now, not directly related to this increase, but one of the things that we've seen is increasing acuity, increasing severity in the mental health service. So my job is as an inpatient consultant psychiatrist. Essentially, if you need to be hospitalized for mental health problems, on, you live on the North Shore of Auckland, you get to be looked after by me. Lucky you. So several hundred thousand people on the North Shore of Auckland. We've got um, about 20 beds for that, so not huge numbers. Um, and that's basically my job, is to try and look after those 20 people. But I can tell you, they're all pretty sick, because they're the sickest 20 people on the North Shore of Auckland. And we've got about 
just under 100 beds across the whole of the Auckland metro sort of area. So there's not huge numbers. And one of the things we've seen is a decrease in the psychiatric beds, that blue line there that you can see. Now, some of that was good because in, in the very early days, you know, before this graph, that was closing the asylums, deinstitutionalization, things like that. But what we've seen is we've seen an increase, the red line, in the percentage of people detained. Now, my unit, actually, we're, we're actually doing relatively well. We've probably got just under half our people are detained under the Mental Health Act, about half are voluntary. But if you go to somewhere like London or some of the massive metro areas, it's virtually impossible to get into hospital unless you are detained under the Mental Health Act. And the problem is the bar is set so high, isn't it? You know, it's almost like in the accident and emergency, the emergency department, you know, you, you, you can't get help unless you've actually self-harmed. If you're just suicidal, I'll tell you to go away and talk to your counsellor. If you've actually self-harmed, then suddenly that triggers entry into the mental health service. And we've got to, we've got to stop that. We've got to get some of these zero suicide ideas going on. I'll, I'll talk about later about not having to sort of show people that you're super ill in order to get help. We ought to be able to ask for help at, at many different levels. But the acuity has gone up. The other graph there, um, the bar graph's going down in years 2010 to 2013. You can see this is the number of self-harm and suicide attempts in mental health units in the UK. So there we are, 23,000 incidents of self-harm and suicide among patients in mental health units. So even being in hospital doesn't keep you safe. And I, I know that. We cannot keep people 100% safe on our ward. Occasionally, we'll have someone on one-to-one -one watch or something like that, but we can't do that, partly because it's, we don't have the money and the resources, but also because part of getting better from a mental health problem is learning to take responsibility for yourself, learning to take agency, and you know that. And if we just wrap people up in cotton wool, they never get any better. And some of that we have to do, perhaps while people are acutely manic and while the medication is kicking in, but at some point, they've got to go home. People can't stay in hospital forever. So there has been a big push for deinstitutionalization. This is something called the Penrose hypothesis. You might have heard of this before. This is Lionel Penrose. Um, I've got a few pictures of famous psychiatrists today, and my, my first thought looking at these was they all look very clever, don't they? I, I would like, when I'm 80, for you to be able to find pictures of me looking, maybe not quite as geeky as that, but certainly looking clever and wise and austere and this sort of thing on when you, when you go Googling. But um, this is Lionel Penrose. He was a mathematician and a psychiatrist, and he did this big study of 18 European countries. And the, the same picture is, 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 is found across Australasia, I can assure you. So what you saw there, the, the, the sort of brownie sort of line it is there, that's the closing of the asylums in the 1950s and the 1960s. That was partly a political thing. It was also partly due to the invention of antipsychotics. So people who had essentially been completely psychotic and raving suddenly got their sanity back. And that's a good thing. I think sometimes we can be slightly sort of critical about medications today. We can be unsure if antidepressants are doing anything. Are they doing more harm than good? Trust me, if you had a serious melancholic depression in 1930, antidepressants would save your life. Okay, so when imipramine and metriptyline were invented in, in the late 1940s, they transformed people who were being bed-bound for months at a time. Antipsychotics transformed people who had been raving for years. And some of the asylums were closed as a result of that. But what happened was the prison population went up. And that is the, uh, sorry, the previous, stick on the other slide there. The prison population went up, which is the blue line. And what we saw was these people being discharged from asylums, but without the right number of support. And the red line there is the total combined mental health and prison hospital population. And what you can see is it's gone down and it's come up again. So if you walk into any remand prison, if you walk into any remand prison around in Australia, you will find that anything between 10 and 15% of the remand populations are actively psychotic. Some of those will find their way to the prison mental health team and get treatment, but many of them will not be detected, perhaps, until later. And these are people who, who could be helped. And strange quirk, Mental Health Act doesn't apply in prison, so you can't mandate treatment for these people who are perhaps so ill they sometimes need it. Don't ask me why. It's something to do with the Romans and the way they set the legal system up. But Criminal Justice and Mental Health Act don't mix for strange reasons. You, you can obviously go to the state hospital and get both. You can be detained under a criminal order and a Mental Health Act order, but in your average prison, here's another hidden group. 
So closing the asylums was something that we ought to have done. But we're needing to play catch up. And one of the reasons was that um, society is having some, some issues. We're struggling with a lot of fragmentation in society. We haven't got the small villages that we used to have. We've got these big urban centers. People are falling through the cracks. And the government's been trying to keep up with this. So this is the Australian mental health budget. And you can see it's been rising year on year, faster than population, big budget initiatives, the big sort of brown, sort of blacky area at the top there. It's been going up. It's gone a little bit further up over the last couple of years. So there's been, you know, one and a half billion in that graph, probably two billion now extra gone into mental health. But things are not changing. We're just fighting this tide. People are getting sicker on the inpatient units because the beds are going down, but we're not cascading that money down into primary care. We're not cascading that money out into the community. And that's where you guys are so important. It's actually, if we can get this sort of entry level resources, get you guys trained up, skilled up, you can be doing that early mental health work. Schools, dentists, adventure clubs, you name it, all these families, employers, you know, we're hearing about superannuation, you know, employers also are there to sort of provide a degree of emotional support. Workplace health and safety, some of that is about dealing with early mental health conditions in the in the workplace, and we're only really just beginning to get that sort of focus on that. So having been a bit sort of iconoclastic and try to sort of destroy some icons, it's almost as though we're left with this sort of picture of the ambulance at, at, at the top of the cliff. The person's just about to fall off the cliff, and here's the ambulance at the top of the cliff. The, the picture in the background, by the way, is Beachy Head. Those of you who might know it from the UK may know it as a leading suicide destination. They call them nowadays. People go there to, to jump off. So that's Beachy Head. A few hundred people jump off that every year. I'm sure you will know the place in Melbourne where people tend to go to kill themselves. It, it will exist. The police will know about it. Samaritans will know about it and hopefully have done some intervention work around it. But we've already perhaps looked at how it's, it's not working. I don't, don't get me wrong. I think the mental health services are actually pretty good at dealing with acute and severe and complex mental illness. So the people who come into my ward, they all go home. They all go home at some point. They all get better, they all go home. They get pretty good care from the community mental health team, but it's very much at the top of the pyramid, so it's very expensive. The cost keeps going up. It's very hospital-focused, secondary care-focused. It's the wrong model to a certain extent because everything is sort of at the top of the pyramid and we need to be doing a little bit more lower down. I think we're missing a trick here around prevention, community-based work. We need to be pushing things down the pyramid. The question is, if we impact there, is that going to result in a change later on, a change higher up? Is that going to change trajectories? Or is it actually just part of, part of good care? So I've been chatting for about 20 minutes. I'm going to take a break there and get you to do a little bit of work. Not because we know, as, as Chris was saying, you guys all really work hard, so we want you to receive today. But actually, I know as a professional educator that now your ECG traces are beginning to slide down into that bit that's equivalent to sleep and watching television. Okay, so we're going to wake you up, going to get you to turn in groups of twos and threes just to the person next to you, and I'm just going to put some questions on the um, screen just for you to work through if you can. The first question is, is the mental health system broken? Yes or no? Or is it like a curate's egg, good in parts? Why is it broken? What is the reason for that? Was I correct in my analysis? What would you do differently and this is the tricky bit, and I'm going to remind you to get round to this question towards the end of your 10 minutes. How would you fund your plans? But don't get to the funding bit, because that's the scary bit at the moment. Um, you know, a couple of pence on income tax or something, I don't know. But is the mental health system broken? Why? What would you do differently? 10 minutes off you go, and I think we've got some nice music to go with that. So thank you. This obviously provoked quite a lot of discussion. Um, Chris is going to come and do some roving mic bit in a little bit. Before I just take questions, I'm just going to just quickly go back to what I was saying about self-harm earlier. Um, Luke's asked me just to point out that um, 
obviously, I think, you know, the, the essence of what I was saying is, is correct, which is don't overreact to it, you know, and I'm sure you don't do that anyway, but I just want to say, you know, don't overreact because that will just drive it under. But the schools you're working in will probably have a policy, okay, about who you have to tell, who you don't have to tell. I suppose my point is, you know, you don't have to sort of jump in a car down the emergency department just because someone is, 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 is self-harming, and you know that. I just wanted to sort of affirm your, your wisdom in that area, but there obviously will be people who you have to tell and certain timescales within which you have to tell them. Um, you know, there's been a big change in, in the UK around school counsellors about the confidentiality of their notes and whether those notes are, are confidential. So, so I know that you guys are facing similar tensions in this country, so obviously please do, do follow your school policy, but also, you know, take some learning around this that actually the way to deal, this is a coping strategy and people will continue to self-harm until they learn a better coping strategy. So it's not something that we respond to as a, an illness or a diagnosis, it is a coping strategy, and we need to try and measure it as such. Okay, so who would just, I mean, you don't have to chip in, but does anyone have a particularly strong view or good discussions in their group? They want to, they want to share answers, you know, is, is the mental health system broken? Why is the mental health system broken? Pop your hand up and Chris will run across to you with a microphone. Somebody over there, thank you, yeah. Uh, I've had two fathers in eight months commit suicide at my school and both of those men had long journeys with mental health issues and from speaking, journeying with those, both of those families and learning more about their struggles, I don't know that we can say... I think mental health issues seem to be so complex that there's not a one-size-fits-all approach that these guys have battled and battled and battled and the system hasn't been able to help them. So you could say that it's broken, like it's frustrating and it's heartbreaking, but it's so, it seems to be so complex and one medication might help for a while and then they change medication. That seems to take away whatever it is that might have been stopping them commit suicide. Um, I think, yeah, it, also, the stigma of mental health, it's, it seems to be a lot harder for people to reach out. It's just another body part, though. I think we need to be educating people that the brain is just another body part. It is a complex, because we think with it as well. Um, yeah, I, I don't know that we could say the system's um, working, mm. but I think mm. that the system is definitely doing the best that it can with a very complex issue and we need to be doing a lot more. Definitely, and it's a huge tension, isn't it? So, you know, as I said earlier, I was trained as a doctor, spent two years working as a house officer in all different specialities, spent a year working in paediatrics, you know, so I know my, my basic medicine, if that makes sense. And the, it is just the brain in there, isn't it? But the problem is the brain's only part of the problem. So you give medications that, you know, antidepressants, perhaps not the right word, you know, serotonin razor yeah. is perhaps a better word. So you raise the person's serotonin, and yes, it does something, but that's actually just part of the problem. There's all the other things that are going around it, habits, that, thinking patterns that have been learned, mm -hmm. systems and families around the person that are, that are affected, and yeah. the person won't change until the system changes and so on. So, yeah, yeah, and I think sort of... So medicalising is really interesting, is that medicalising mental illness has helped reduce stigma, because you can now go to your GP and say, I'm depressed. You know, you're not weak or stupid or sinful. Um, the church, I think, hopefully, is moving away from that I'm sinful kind of idea. Um, but medicalising it also has a downside, where it's another tablet, let's change the antidepressant, let's change the antidepressant, let's change the antidepressant. We need to be thinking about these as, as, as complex problems. Yeah, yeah. Anyone want to... OK, we we'll take one more question just there in terms of the first couple of points. Yeah. I think that... Um, it's a bit loud. Um, I think that um, the, uh, the issue uh, for me is that um, uh, it's a multi-generational uh, issue and it's something that's been uh, creeping up for, uh, for quite a long time. And, uh, you know, war creates problems within families and uh, issues uh, that continues to, uh, to uh, exacerbate things like uh, bullying and... Um, and um, beating kids in, uh, 
in families that mm. uh, we in the, uh, the schools, and especially in primary schools, got uh, a chance to build relationships with, uh, with parents to, uh, to find out what's happening in the, uh, um, in, the, in the family to try and help them. And it may be uh, poverty, but it might be um, expectation and you know, how they're actually uh, dealing with their children. So, you know, from a, uh, uh, maybe a, a secondary perspective, it's a bottomless pit of kids coming through the doors mm. and you try and help to, uh, to uh, refer them on to um, uh, clinicians in the other uh, community health centres or uh, into um, you know, GPs to try and get them some support. But as um, uh, chaplains in primary, it's more about early intervention and to, uh, to try and, uh, you know, try and help them to, uh, to build resilience yep. uh, in the early years and talk to parents about stronger, stronger families and, uh, and so on. So, you know, it's not broken, but it's, mm. um, you know, it's close. Uh, you know, it's overloaded. Yep. And we can't get, you know, um, clinicians to, uh, to see people for, uh, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks, and it takes ages to, uh, to get people in. Yep. Uh, you know, it's hard. But yeah, I think, definitely. you know, we start from the early years. So you just stole my next talk, which is on resilience, which is the answer, but that's okay. I've got some slides to go with it. But you're right, I think get, there's things that we can do early. So, you know, a big focus of this conference is talking about resilience, obviously, but there's other stuff in there, talking about domestic violence, family violence. Um, we, we just got to stop it. You know, it's not acceptable. Uh, and yes, you can have a debate about the smacking debate and things like that, but the, the degree of family violence that, you know, is still going on is, is way beyond any kind of spectrum we, we might want to debate there. And, and it's just happening. Minim alcohol alcohol use in families. You know, Scotland's one of the first countries in the world that's just brought in minimum unit pricing for alcohol, because we've known for decades it has an impact on the public health consumption of alcohol. But governments are so slow to bring in big initiatives and changes like that that perhaps could, could change the early environment for people. Okay, talking about resilience, alcohol. What else, someone might be over from this side of the room, what would, we, what would you do differently? Um, and if you can, how are you gonna fund it? What would you do differently? Yeah, lady just here. Um, I think early intervention, the earlier uh, as possible is the solution. Um, I, you can't fund it, but I think we have a community that um, can deal with it. And I do believe it takes a village to raise a child. And we've got out of a, a village um, mentality and, uh, you know, we have children that are traumatised and their brain development is affected as babes and uh, that doesn't change. They grow into adults mm. that have mental illness and uh, so we need to get in far earlier. But we don't have the funds, we don't have the trained people, but we can train a, com a community to be aware and to become involved and work long term commit themselves long-term to families that are overwhelmed with parenting or life. Yeah, definitely. And I, th I think you're right. And it's not, it's not necessarily complex work. Now, some of what I know, some of you are trained in psychological therapies. I know some of you have done some training in psychological therapies, but we're not, we're not talking about that kind of thing. We're talking about fairly basic kind of stuff, bit of mentoring, setting up a bit of peer mentoring. You know, there, there are skills in that, but peers can mentor. You know, and I, th I think there's the, the, the more we can get those kind of sort of global sort of things, actually anyone can do this. One of the things we'll talk about later is, you know, who can deliver resilience training and resilience work? And, you know, one of the answers is anyone who has become resilient, if that makes sense. And obviously there's ways to do it and a bit of training in how to do it. But, you know, it, it, these, these are not rocket science things. We're not talking about complex psychotherapy you need to train for five years to do. These are fairly, fairly simple kinds of things. Okay, anyone else bursting to chip in? Gentleman just over there, hand shot up. These microphones, by the way, are sort of here, sort of level. They're not the ones that you eat. Okay, so put the mic down here. I'll just... <laughs> <laughs> um, what, I'm, what I'm finding is um, so many people, when dealing with the first contact with people who are struggling with mental illness, are giving unqualified opinions, judgment and statements. 
even when we pick up, uh, I work in, I live in South Australia and I work in Victorian schools. We take people um, and try and get them a safe bed. Um, sometimes the nurses are judgmental, legalistic, and these are top, top, um, you know, professional people and they're very hard. So we've got all these people, um, and including myself if I make mistakes, saying stuff that I shouldn't be saying instead of listening and the words that we use, especially when we really um, were untrained, um, are really damaging to children. And um, like um, I was dealing with somebody the other day and the teacher said, oh, she's just a drama queen. Yeah. Um, you know, she'd all grow up, you know, and, and he's an attention yeah. seeker. And I said, and how much training have you done in the mental health, mental health area? She said, oh, no, no, no. I went, oh, well, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. As far as funding it, I reckon we, um, mm -hmm. I'll be prepared to pay more in my, Medi my Medicare levy as long as that money went to med medical health, put it up 2% or whatever, I'd, yeah. I'd deal with that. Or mm -hmm. maybe the corporate businesses that don't pay any tax. <laughs> that, was, that was on the news this morning, wasn't yes, it? Yes, I think that may help us. <laughs> <laughs> So I was, well, listen to a bit of that. Yeah, you know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. You know, never was a greater untruth spoken. Never was a greater untruth spoken. That is just not true, is it? Now, we're not sort of glass skull people where one word will, 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 will kill someone. But these things accumulate, and there's this culture here, isn't there? Yeah, and I think, I think you know, some funding, I think, is probably where we need to go. Because if we try and fund prevention... You just rob Peter to pay Paul. You take it away from the inpatient units. But, you, you know, is that the answer? Don't know. We'll come on to that. Anyway, thank you. I think, yeah, more, more taxes, possibly a good idea. I'm not going to get into politics. Stay away from politics. I can do religion and I can do sex because that's part of psychotherapy, isn't it? But no, no politics today. So, anyway, before I get told off anymore, let's carry on. Thank you, Chris. That, that's brilliant. So, um, this was, this was some work, this is 20,000 people responding to the Mental Health Task Force in the UK in 2017. Um, just pop that slide up there, um, thanks. So this is 20,000 20, people sort of saying the kind of things they think mental health ought to get more funding in or, or, or ought to be developing. And obviously some of that is access, and we've already heard here about... Um, long waiting lists, particularly in child and adolescent psychiatry. There's, there's something here in child and adolescent psychiatry about it just takes a long time to see someone. The work seems to take a long time. And I, I know it's complex work, but it, it just seems to take a long, a long time and sort of rapid access clinics and one-stop shops and that sort of thing don't really seem to, be, seem to be the answer. Something about choice of treatments. People are sort of saying, actually, do you know what? I've, I've got... Some ideas here. I'm actually capable of researching this myself. I want to be involved in my treatment choice, and we need to get better at that. But the big one down there, prevention. Prevention, prevention, prevention. And that's what I want to sort of finish off the first talk, sort of talking about um, in, in terms of prevention. On the next slide, we've just got some numbers. This is how much um, Australia is spending on health services. So your direct costs for mental health services, and this is within health. This is not sort of funding chaplaincy. Isn't it great, by the way, that chaplaincy's got more funding for another few years, which is fantastic? But this is like core health costs, 6.3 billion. Whole system costs, 28.6 billion. That is because of the benefits and the loss of work and the impact on families and carers and things like that. Almost 30 billion people, that's 2% of, of GDP of, of Australia. Now you compare that to the entire health prevention budget, that includes anti-smoking, anti-obesity, all the anti-things, um, as opposed to pro-health. It'd be good to have some of that as well, wouldn't it? But the two billion, that is $89 per Australian, is, is spelt, spent on prevention, health prevention. So it's, it's a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of the health budget goes on prevention, 1.34%. Interesting enough, it's less than the UK and New Zealand. It's 0.14% of gross domestic product. But if we can do prevention, thanks, um, this, is, this is the slide that we need to be thinking about. If we, if we intervene early, and you know, we've been saying some of this, if we intervene early, will that result in less problems down the line? Now, there's many, many opportunities for intervention, just, just the next slide there, throughout life that you can see. And what we know is that before age 24 is the key time. You probably know this, but the, you know, the prognosis goes down dramatically. Once the illness is established, once the first symptoms are there, if that makes sense, 
it's, the prognosis changes dramatically. Now, yes, you know, there are particular triggers, particular impacts on people. Depression is a relapsing, relapsing remitting condition, so it does get better. You can have an episode of depression after a trauma or um, a bereavement or, or, or something like that, but it's, it's getting in before that first episode. And we know these have the opportunities, perinatal, maternal mental health, this whole idea about the babies and the bond that the mother has with the baby initially as being quite important. Um, the parenting in terms of how we're bringing kids up, how we're encouraging them, empowering them, and perhaps some of the mistakes that we've, we've made in the past around that as well. And also school, so everything pre-further education, that's where you guys are working in primary school with well-being programs in schools, resilience programs, all these things are opportunities to intervene. And we, we can do it. The problem is, we're sometimes not doing what is research-based. So I think somebody over here was, was saying that, um, you know, we, we need to do things that make a difference. And you're right, but the problem is there's lots of things that you could do, and we don't know which ones make a difference and which ones don't. They all sound good, you know. Taking the kids for an Outward Bounds day, you know, fantastic, let's get out into the countrysides. Does it make any difference to your mental health? Short answer is, we don't know. We think it might do, it sounds as though it might do, but we don't actually know. There's a few things that we do know make a difference to mental health, and that's why we're going to be focused on resilience training for this, this conference. And we need to be focusing on those things that are actually proven to make a difference. So I thought I'd finish off this talk this morning by doing a bit of an overview about what do we know about mental health promotion. And I'm very lucky because last week in The Lancet, this massive review article came out. And the links, on the, the links on the next slide, preventative strategies for mental health. This is basically everything we know in the world at the moment about prevention for, 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 for mental health conditions. And there is quite a lot in here, but what I will say is there's also quite a lot that's not in here. So there's, people will always be touting their ministry, their solution, their app, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We need to make sure that we're offering evidence-based interventions. Otherwise, we've only got so much money, we've got to make sure we spend it on things. So this is a graphic from the, um, on the next slide, this is a graphic from the, from the paper. And th this is showing some of the areas where we can intervene. Now, this might sound a bit sci-fi, so let me take you through this um, one line at a time. The top line there is genetic. Now, the first risk factor there that we might be able to intervene is a positive family history of, of mental disorders. Now, we, we've known for a long time that these disorders are genetic. We know that schizophrenia is a genetic condition by and large. You know, if you have two parents with schizophrenia, there's a 50 to 60% chance that, that you will, will have it. It's, it's pretty genetic, and that's independent of the early childhood environment. This is proven by adoption studies, twin studies, etc. cetera. We, we know it's a pretty genetic condition. Depression we thought was less genetic, but actually one of the reasons why the hereditability figures are lower for depression is because it's not as easy to diagnose depression. Schizophrenia is pretty easy to say, yep, that person's got schizophrenia, that person's got some other kind of psychotic disorder. And psychiatrists across the globe will, generally speaking, agree on which cases are which and which ones aren't. Depression's different because it's such a spectrum. And when you've got a massive spectrum disorder like that, it's more difficult to prove the hereditability. But if you allow for that, what we know is that depression is almost as genetic as, as schizophrenia. So there are genetic things that we can be doing. Now, I'm not advocating genetic changing and things like that, and, and things obviously that's an area we don't want to be getting into or talking about, but there are things that we can begin to think about now. We know that there are genetic things here, SNV, single nucleotide variants. We know there are certain differences between this person's DNA and this person's DNA that can cause severe illnesses like schizophrenia or dementia or things like that. We, we've known the epidemiology for a long time, but now we're beginning to know the genetics. Question is, should we do anything about that? Is that an opportunity for prevention or change? But like, for example, when I was growing up, we, we knew that if you were born in the spring, you had a higher risk of psychosis during your life. We, we've known that epidemiologically for decades. Only now are we able to show about some of the epigenetics, some of the viruses that are around in that time as to how that mechanism might work. And one of the things that I'm going on about this is I think we, we need perhaps to understand more about the causal mechanisms of mental illness. Because what we've got at the moment is we've got serotonin increases for depression, 
We've got dopamine decreases for schizophrenia, but they're not treating the cause. They're treating the symptoms, they're treating the voices, they're treating the low mood as a result. It's like taking paracetamol for a headache. Good thing to do, but please, 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 let's try and understand where the headache is coming from. So we're, we're beginning to understand more about where these illnesses are coming from. We've got some population fact factors there that we know are there. Poor nutrition, exposure to drugs and medication, brain trauma, substance abuse, parental neglect, child maltreatment, parental mental illness, perinatal development, bullying. Someone mentioned bullying already. Bullying comes in twice. So there are things that we know, and we know that if we intervene to tackle those particular things, they actually reduce the incidence of mental health in those groups going forward. We're beginning to get long-term studies coming forward. And that, I think, is good news, because we're actually beginning to understand what works and what doesn't. And on the next slide, I'll just put some examples down there. We need to think about different levels of promotion as well. So, levels of prevention, rather. So at the top, you've got mental health promotion. This is just getting the word out there. And like I said, I think that's something that has changed over the last 10 years. This is now on the topic. It's now on the curriculum. School-based programs to foster healthy eating and positive coping skills. You know, these, these things are being spoken about. Young people are talking about mental health. Netflix will produce a series like 13 Reasons Why. You know, these, these things are in the public domain. Universal primary prevention, what that means is let's reduce gen general risk factors for one or more conditions. So if we do anti-bullying programs or bullying prevention programs in schools, that will impact across a number of different mental health conditions, okay? Targeted primary things, so reducing specific risk factors. If you know that there is severe mental illness in the family, actually what specifically can you be doing and working with, with those children? And then we're getting into um, indicated primary. We're beginning to see things here, you know, treating subclinical manifestations to prevent a full-blown disorder. People perhaps who you wonder if they're developing a psychotic illness. They're 14, 15, 16, grades are dropping off, they're becoming a bit more distant, perhaps they're using more cannabis, they've perhaps had a, a few episodes of being a bit more paranoid. You're thinking, is, is this going to turn into schizophrenia or something like that? If, if what can I do now? Secondary early intervention, how do we get early detection, improved access for those people? We're here in Melbourne, so who's heard of Origin? Okay, National, National Centre of Excellence for Youth Mental Health in, in Melbourne. Um, and one of the big researching areas in this whole youth mental health idea. So, so getting better access, I'm going to talk about that in one of my seminars this afternoon, but how we can actually get good access programmes for people who are suicidal, people who are in the early stages of psychosis. And tertiary treating established illness, improving comorbid risk factors with physical health and suicide. So there's an awful lot of different levels at which we can interact to change the trajectory. And I think some of those will fit more with chaplaincy. Some of those will be things that you'll have to do as part of chaplaincy because you've got a couple of more complex cases in your school. I'll probably say a couple. It's probably quite a lot more than that, I think, isn't it? What prevents prevention? What stops us doing this? What stops us waiting until the last minute? And there's a number of reasons that from in the paper that I've just listed here, and I think these are fairly self-intuitive, but they're worth spelling out. One is that those at the highest risk present the least. So we know that people who are struggling most are usually the last to come forward. Um, I've spent most of my life working in deprived areas, in cities, and we get people who almost come crawling out of the, the, the flats and the tenements with advanced stages of illness. I, I talk to my colleagues who work in private psychiatry or more affluent areas of the city, and they've got a whole bunch of different things that are, they're dealing with, and the, the threshold seems to be quite a lot different, and the people with the more severe illnesses are really struggling there. We're not good at me measuring prevention, only illness. We know how many people have got depression. What we don't know how many people didn't get depression because of the prevention that we did. We're not very good at measuring that. So all the focus is on the numbers and the illness. We need to get better at measuring the changes. It's hard to do ethical research. If, if you run an anti-bullying campaign, you're going to pick up more bullies. Now, is that right or wrong? You know, if that makes sense. You know, you, you're, going to, you're going to raise the issue. There's going to be people who are now concerned who weren't concerned before. Some of them needed to be concerned. Some of them didn't need to be concerned. And you get more false positives coming out when we start expanding these things. They're long-term benefits only. They're not attractive to funders and politicians. You're not going to see change coming up over the next 
few years. This is going to be decades down the line. There's no money, talked about robbing Peter to pay Paul already, and we've already spoken about stigma. Needing help is weak. It's not the same, is it, as, as, as cardiac risk. I'm just going to jump forward two slides, if I can, to the purple one there. Um, there is a prevention first framework here in Australia. This comes from the East Coast, but it's, it's coming this way, I believe, about the prevention first framework, and there's good, good resources there. And just on the next slide, one thing to think about. Um, we're not going to do this exercise just now, but if I said to you, right, give me five things that you can do to stay physically healthy, you'd all say, oh, you know, I need to maintain a healthy wealth, weight, I need to make healthy food choices, stay active, I need to stop smoking. Those messages are out there. That's what you do to stay physically fit. And the hope is if you do that, you'll have less strokes, less heart attacks, that sort of thing. If I say, can you name five things that you can do to stay mentally healthy, what would you come up with? Now, a little while ago, you might say, oh, do, do, a, do a Sudoku every day. Um, but I mean, I'm, I'm being slightly cheesy about that, because there's a little tiny, weeny, weeny bit of evidence that if you do do a Sudoku every day, you might have less depression, and this whole idea about that dementia, rather than this whole idea of brain training and that sort of thing. But if I said to you, right, okay, what five things do you do in your life that make you more mentally healthy? Obviously, coming to conferences like this is good. Um, but what are the things that you're, you're, you're doing? I'm just going to... I'm just going to end up with, just go back a couple of slides if we can. We haven't got 10 minutes because I've, I've talked too much, but just for a few minutes at the end, I'd like you to have a quick chat, get into the groups that you're in before, give some examples of mental health promotion. What kinds of things are going on in your school? Where are chaplains mainly working? Are they primary, secondary, tertiary? How could you do more? How could you prove it worked? Maybe you won't get onto those, but just discuss a little bit about some of the prevention that is, is going on in, in your schools, and then I'll call us back together in a couple of minutes and we'll finish for morning tea. Okay, let's just... Pop that comparisons with cardiology slide up again. I'm, I'm not going to ask you for your feedback because your, your caffeine levels at this point are needing a boost. But can, can we name five things that we can do to stay well mentally? And um, I think one of those things on the next slide, I'm going to talk about this next, is just resilience. But I'll just say a quick word about resilience just now. Um, one of the things we can do, one of the things we know works, and one of the things that actually, when you get into it, is fairly simple to understand, I think, is, is resilience. How we cope with the setbacks of life. What can we do now in terms of changing how we think and, and believe and behave that will be of relevance to us later? How does this relate to the Christian faith? Is this new resilience when I was young was something that happened in physics lessons? This now is a broader term, isn't it? So what we're going to do, we're going to take a half-hour break for coffee and we're going to come back after lunch. But I think, you know, resilience... I've actually been converted, I think, um, from, from preparing these talks, you know, as a secondary care physician, kind of at the end of the line, if that makes sense. I, I do all of my work in tertiary prevention, if not setting people up for, for lifelong care. So, so actually beginning to think about primary prevention, about what works in prevention for mental illness, thinking about resilience. I've been speaking to colleagues who are public health physicians, people who are advocates in this area, who work for some of the mental health organizations. Resilience, I think, is something that can make a difference, but it's not going to be the answer to everything. It's not going to be the panacea, and there are a few things that we can learn about it. Um, which I think make a real difference and help us do it well. So I'm going to talk more about that after coffee, and there are also many seminars covering that. So thank you.